Welcome to this uh, first part of the pathology um, of the uh, neuroendocrine tumors. Um, <clears throat> I'm really glad to be here in Vienna. But have a look at this wonderful castle in Munich. It's the castle of Nymphenburg and maybe the next place where we can convene. I have the, uh, the task to introduce you to the um, new classification. And the new WHO classification came out in November last year, 10 years after the previous classification appeared. And when the new classification came out, everybody was very content with the old classification. But when I remember the days when the old classification came out, that was the year 2000, everybody was criticizing this classification and that this is something we never, we, we never will take and we, we must have something else. So we worked for 10 years. Now we have the new classification. Everybody is criticizing that. However, I would like <clears throat> to make you familiar with this classification. I think um, it has some sh uh, charm, it has some progress in it, and, and particularly we understand each other on both sides of the ocean. That was the difficulty with the old classification which was accepted on this side of the ocean but not accepted on the other side. Well, <clears throat> the uh, new classification has some working principles, and the working principles are that for the first time the name neuroendocrine was uh, accepted. And this is because we are dealing with a particular endocrine system. The oh. endocrine system consists of the neuroendocrine and the non neuroendocrine. That for the first time this was accepted, and these are the peptide producing, peptide hormone producing tumors, and these are those tumors that share neural endocrine markers, such as synaptophysin and chromocrenin, and these markers define these tumors at the morphological level. And neuroendocrine neoplasms is then the term that includes the well and the poorly differentiated tumors. And there is uh, another premise. All neuroendocrine neoplasms have a, a malignant potential. And you remember Professor Grossman saying that Oberndorfer in 1907 uh, still claimed that carcinoid is a benign tumor. And now we say exactly the opposite, that all neuroendocrine tumors have a malignant potential no matter where they arise, no matter how small they are. And this has an influence on the incidence data because neuroendocrine neoplasia are now regard, uh, that were regarded as benign, for instance, those arising in the stomach are now considered in the incidence data, have to be considered. That will shift a little bit the incidence figures among the different groups of endocrine tumors. Um, <clears throat> what are the criteria on which the classification is based? These criteria are not new. These are also the criteria of the old classification, but a little bit more simplified. So we have the tumor histopathology differentiating in well and poorly differentiated, the proliferative activity, and then the side size, infiltration, invasion, metastasis, um, and that is, um, uh, uh, this is adjusted to the site, and that means esophagus, stomach, duodenum, ileum, appendix, colorectum, and the pancreas. And with those criteria, this classification is formed, and this is a comparison between the very old, the old, and the new one. In the new one, we have, again, as a new word, the neuroendocrine neoplasms. That is covering 
all the well-differentiated and the poorly differentiated tumors. And then the second, what is new, we have now the term neuroendocrine tumor, replacing the term well-differentiated endocrine tumor. So well-differentiated endocrine tumor, a rather long term, is replaced by neuroendocrine tumor. And the idea behind was that the term carcinoid is equivalent to a term neuroendocrine tumor without mentioning that this is well differentiated. Because here, you also do not mentioning that carcinoid is a well differentiated tumor. And as the word carcinoid um, is the term that is mainly used across the ocean, still used, and still used by many clinicians, and also still used by many pathologists, the term carcinoid is still in this classification and uh, it is equivalent to the term NET G1. Then we have a NET G2, and at the beginning we said this is also equivalent to carcinoid, and in, in some way it is. But you know, it's a bit tricky to say this is the same when we make a distinction between G1 and G2. Then um, it was the uh, um, uh, the, the idea to call it atypical carcinoid, but this is not defined for the gap system, so we took it out and only left carcinoid here. So we have those two neuroendocrine tumors, which are well differentiated, but graded in G1 and G2, and they repl replace these two terms. And then there is a great step forward, and this is the step to neck. Neck neuroendocrine carcinoma is now reserved for poorly differentiated endocrine carcinoma. And it is distinguished between a large cell type and a small cell type of this tumor. So neuroendocrine carcinoma, which is also in this term, is now only reserved for the poorly differentiated tumor. And <clears throat> with these uh, um, things, we come to the proliferative activity, which plays a very important role in this classification. And you see G1, G2 is associated with the well-differentiated tumors. G3 is associated with the poorly differentiated tumors. The question then arises, isn't there the case of a well differentiated that has a G3 proliferative activity? And indeed, this is something we experience, particularly in metastasis of those tumors here. And if this is the case, then you can a G3 even use for the, for the well differentiated neuroendocrine tumor. Um, we have then the mixed Adeno neuroendocrine carcinoma, among them is the goblet cell carcinoid, and we have hypoplastic and preneoplastic lesions. But uh, here, these are the main players of the classification. How do those terms, NET G1, NET G2, and NET G or NEC? G3 translate to the old terms. And here you see <clears throat> the survival of the tumors that are classified according to the old classification. And this is uh, from a work of Aldo Scarpa appearing in 2010. And you see, if you use the old classification, there is a good stratification. And now the, is the question, if you translate it into the new classification, can you translate it without any difficulty? Well, um, half and half. So the net G1 translates to the uh, so-called well-differentiated endocrine tumor with benign behavior. The neck, the poorly differentiated, translates to this here. However, the well differentiated endocrine tumors of uncertain malignancy and 
the well-differentiated endocrine carcinomas translate to this group, and it is not, this can be among this group here, this can be among this group, so it's not, not an ideal uh, translation. Here we have to look at each tumor, how we classify them. We can't go from this to that in one step. Um, <clears throat> now, the very important groups are, of course, the well-differentiated uh, group and the poorly differentiated group. And the question is, is this a true distinction? Or is it only because we, as pathologists, declare this tumor to be poorly differentiated and this tumor to be well differentiated. Well, the histopathology tells us that uh, they are well or poorly differentiated, and this is extremely important for the pathologist to make this distinction at the first step. And I would like to introduce you, because most of you are not pathologists, and uh, they are, you are a clinician, you should get an idea. This is a well differentiated. This is the tumor that Oberndorfer described as carcinoid. This is a poorly differentiated, never been described by Oberndorfer. That was described for the first time as small cell carcinoma of the lung. This is the, the classical prototype of it. And now look at these two tumors, they look very different. So do we think they um, have a sort of a transition from here to there? In, during the course of the disease? Or do we think they are, these are two tumors? Well, we think they are two tumor types and very different from each other. And this is, of course, then also very important for the treatment. And even if they metastasize these tumors, tumors they ought at least most of them, let's say 98% of them, uh, remain to be a well-differentiated tumor type and why? I try to, to explain that to you. This is a hypothesis, and this is nothing more than that. There is not uh, so much so far clear-cut evidence for it. However, if we uh, look at the embryological development of the endocrine cells in the intestine and the pancreas, then this development is driven by transcription factors such as PDX1 and CDX2. And the Further transcription factors drive then these cells to precursor endocrine cells in the duodenum and elsewhere. And again, other um, transcription factors then drive these cells to well differentiated or endpoint differentiated cells. And the same happens in the pancreas. And again, we have transcription factors which are behind this development. However, what I wanted to point out is that it is a multi-step development. And in between the stem cells here and the well-differentiated cells, there are some pre-pro cells that, uh, that arise. And if you think about it, then you can hypothesize that the poorly differentiated may come from such a cell and the well differentiated from such a cell. And it makes sense. If we look at the molecular pathology in this tumor, then we see that the poorly differentiated and the well differentiated tumors have different molecular pathologies. Here we have an LOH uh, at 11Q and sometimes an MEN1 um, mut mutation. Here in those, we never have this constellation. We have P53 and all these other um, mutations, but never this. So this is probably a good explanation why indeed well and poorly differentiated are two uh, sides of the coin um, that we have. Now, next step. <clears throat> this is the first, so we have to decide upon. I have to tell you, of course, the poorly differentiated make up an account for, let's say, uh, 3%, maximum 5% of all the neuroendocrine tumors, while the well differentiated, uh, they are the bulk of the neuroendocrine tumors. Um, sorry, coming back to this, the next step is then 
that we want to have this, the positivity of synaptophysin and chromocrenin as the accept, accepted markers of the system. You can say, why? We, we know now uh, it's a carcinate, it's a carcinate, it's a carcinate. Why do we have these markers with it? However, I can tell you in practice, there are quite a lot, quite a lot of tumors recognized as neuroendocrine tumors. They turn out to be non uh, uh, neuroendocrine tumors. And therefore, we insist that we have the positivity of these two markers to make the diagnosis of a neuroendocrine tumor. So, then, if we go forward, we have first an H&E slide. This is showing a well-differentiated tumor. Then we have a synaptophysin slide with a nice positivity, and then we have a chromocranin slide with this positivity. Do we need both? Yes, we need both. We, I would like to explain it to you. Here we have a neuroendocrine cell. This is <clears throat> the nucleus. Uh, these are the hormone, the peptide hormone granules, they're called neurosecretory granules, and these are the uh, small vesicles. They are coated by synaptophysin proteins. So this is synaptophysin in the cell, and this is chromocranin A in the cell that resides in the membrane of the neurosecretory granules. And here we have the peptide hormone, with his, uh, which is in the, the granule. Now you see these, these small vesicles, they are in the cell, whether it is well granulated or poorly granulated. Well granulated means a lot of those hormone granules, poorly means only one or two. These are staying in the cell, so the cell will always be positive for synaptophysin. If there's only one or two of these granules, or let's say one, then we have a very poor chromocranin A staining. In case, for instance, of the poorly differentiated, you may have even a negativity for chromocranin, but always a synaptophysin positivity. Therefore, we need both markers. Now, it's also interesting, of course, um, these are secreted, and nowadays, of course, we use chromocrenin as a serum test, and it is very interesting to correlate the, the, the levels of chromocrenin in the serum with that what is going on in the cell. It is not a 100% correlation. I mean, there are cases where you have a chromocrenin almost negativity, but you have a, a, a big tumor, for instance, when, if you have a poorly differentiated neuroendocrine tumor. So, there are exceptions. Exceptions to the rule that chromocranin A and synaptophysin are the markers and the specific markers for neuroendocrine cells, neuroendocrine tumors. Chromocranin A may be negative or almost negative in cases where there is a somatostatin production in the tumor, and these are some of the duodenal neuroendocrine tumors or in rectal neuroendocrine tumors. So pathologists have not to be surprised that they have such a tumor here and it doesn't stain for chromocranin A. They are almost negative, or, or a lot of them are negative of the paraganglomas for chromocranin A. On the other hand, Synaptophysin may be positive in adrenal cortex tumors. Nobody knows why, but it's the case that adrenal cortex tumor may be positive or in this, uh, this uh, colibri tumor of the pancreas called solid pseudopapillary tumor. So the third step is then the proliferative activity, G1 to G3, and <clears throat> the proliferative activity is measured, and this is the most easiest way, by the KI67 or MIP1 staining that gives us such a nice picture. You can do it by mitotic counting mitosis, but in my hands, in my eyes, this is much easier. And <clears throat> the, the system behind is that we have to count cells so counting is in, it's no eyeballing, it's counting cells. And then um, by counting them, we 
distinguish between those that are that have an index below 2%, those between 2 and 20%, and G3 above 20%. Um, <clears throat> again, this can be replaced by mitotic counting, but this is something I would recommend. And I also recommend, this is a personal recommendation, it's not in the classification. The classification says you have to count 1,000 cells, but in practice, that is much too much. So 100 cells, and how we can do it, I can, I can uh, tell you later, 100 cells is usually enough. So um, now we have then the, uh, um, these grades that I just um, commented upon. And uh, again, the poolies have all a grade three. All are above 20%. So stage, <clears throat> stage and, uh, is um, then in addition to the classification, it's the T and M stage. And it is a site-specific T and M stage. And unfortunately, there exist now two proposals. And, um, and this is something that happened. Um, and now we have to accept it that it happened. Um, the first proposal was that by ENETS. That has been evaluated. Uh, this is then the proposal by the UICC that has not been evaluated. Uh, how, does it, uh, how does it work? Well, we can say UICC and the ENETS classification uh, corresponds um, more or less it, at the site of stomach, duodenum, jejunum, and colorectum. However, it does not correspond for the appendix and the pancreas. And I just, and it is, it also does not include, this classification does not include the poorly differentiated neuroendocrine tumors. Well, I will just give you an example. You see, if you compare T2 in ENETS and in UICC, this differs, this differs from each other, and that make a big difference. And if you stratify the tumors according to this and to that, you have different results. And uh, we have done that for the ENETs and all the, uh, there are now five papers on record. They show a, a wonderful stratification, which is not the case here. And we have a, a similar confusion with respect to appendiceal tumors. If you compare, sorry, that was the appendix. Now it's the pancreas. If you compare that, they are, there are differences. Well, last, I would like to, to say just a word about the um, uh, definition of the mixed tumor. The mixed tumor of the monic have a carcinoma phenotype that is recognizable as both adenocarcinoma and neuroendocrine carcinoma, and each component exceeds at least 30% of the cells. It's a definition, so um, if it's below 30% by definition is no longer a manic. This is some tricky thing, but it is uh, the best we could do. Both components should be graded. And the identification in adenocarcinomas of scattered neuroendocrine cells, that means below 30%, means that they does, do not qualify for a manic. So my last slide, we have a very easy classification. Now I would like to say a positive word about the new classification. We have a very easy classification. It takes into account histologic differentiation, grading, staging. And that staging means side by side, size, and T and M. And even this bird understands it. But you know, nothing is perfect. We wait for another 10 years, and we will have a new classification solving all these problems. Thank you. Thank you.